power of knowledge, the power of technology. This is you to the power of IBM. Find out how you can do your best work at ibm.com slash you. Get in touch with technology with Tech Stuff from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey there, and welcome to Tech Stuff. I am your host, Jonathan Strickland. I'm an executive producer here at How Stuff Works, and we made it, guys, all the way to episode 900. And they said it couldn't be done, or shouldn't be done. One of the two. Who's to say? But happy 900th episode of Tech Stuff, at least according to my notes, which could clearly be totally wrong. Uh, this may or may not be the 900th episode. I use a spreadsheet and I do a little plus one. And according to that, it's 900. So we're going to treat it like it's the 900th, because if it's not, you can just be comforted in knowing that there's no real significance to any particular number anyway. In other words, listen to every Tech Stuff episode like it's the 900th one or something. For today's episode, we're going to do something I should have covered hundreds of episodes ago. We're going to look at the How Stuff Works story. It's a little different from how How Stuff Works works. I think I have done that episode in the past, but this is more about the story of the company. And it's a complicated one for multiple reasons. Now, one of those is that we have two very different branches of the company these days. We have the website, HowStuffWorks.com. That's the that's the business that hired me oh so many years ago. It's the home to thousands of articles about all sorts of topics. And then we have the podcast network, of which Tech Stuff is a part, along with other great shows like Stuff You Should Know, Stuff You Missed in History Class, and shows that aren't so great like Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. That's for you, Ben Bolin. Uh, and more. Uh, we have those two different branches. And now, even though I got hired for HowStuffWorks.com, I work for the podcast side. In this episode, I'm going to focus mainly on that website side of the business. We will later on chat with Allison Loudermilk. She is the head of the editorial department here at HowStuffWorks.com. And we'll learn all about the process of pitching and selecting and editing articles for the site, as well as how things have changed since she came on board. And we'll look at the company in general and how that's changed over the years. So actually, we'll start with that. The history of how stuff works dates back to 1998. And that's when Marshall Brain, and yes, that is his real name, decided to launch a website that would host articles about how stuff works. Marshall Brain was born in 1961 in Santa Monica, California. And he attended a polytechnic institute over in New York, earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and then went on to earn his master's degree in computer science at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he became a computer science professor there between 1986 and 1992. In 92, he founded a software training and consulting company. And in 1998, he began publishing articles online on his new web page, which he dubbed How Stuff Works. Uh, early articles mostly focused on technology. How a Car Engine Works is typically cited as the first article on the site. The truth is lost to antiquity. Or we just haven't been able to get a straight story to find out. But How a Car Engine Works is typically the one we say, yeah, that, that's kind of the first real How Stuff Works article. But others that came out that same year would include How Television Works, How the Radio Spectrum Works, how a thermos works, and Marshall Brain's site became popular and attracted lots of visitors. And in 2000, he decided he would hold a round of venture capital funding in order to ramp up this website, because up to that point, it had really been a hobby. He wasn't looking at it as a full business, but he saw the site grow and he formed a an entire business out of it. He hired on a staff. He set up a headquarters in Cary, North Carolina, but he did find it challenging to create a business that had an ongoing source of revenue. He wasn't able to really figure out that part out or, or at least get the backing of advertisers to really make a go of it. And by the end of 2001, he had to cut back on about half of his company's staff. So while he had hired on a bunch of people after that first round of venture capital funding, that money didn't last forever. And the revenue just hadn't come around yet. So he laid off about half the people he had had to hire. He couldn't get the advertising support he needed to keep the site going. He sought another round of venture funding. And in 2002, 
There's a private company that was called Convex that made an offer to buy How Stuff Works and Brain accepted. The price was the princely sum of one million dollars. The Convex Group was an entertainment and investment company. It was founded by a guy named Jeff Arnold. Jeff Arnold started his career uh, doing starting several other businesses, but really was known for being the founder of a website called WebMD, which has been terrifying people ever since. Whenever you have an ache, pain, or strange rash, you go to WebMD, and then you realize that you've got some sort of Venusian death cold or something. But he founded this company. It was wildly successful. However, it wasn't a runaway hit right out of the gate. Arnold actually left WebMD after the dot-com crash that happened around 2000-2001, and he said that he just didn't feel like he could lead WebMD through that that turmoil. He didn't have the experience to do it. So instead, he went and created the Convex Group. Now, the Convex Group was a company, like I said, that invested in largely entertainment ventures, and they acquired several other entities. So they purchased other companies. One of those was a company called Lidrock. Do you remember Lidrock? If not, here's a quick refresher. Once upon a time... My dear listeners, there were movie theater chains in the United States in particular, but in other countries as well, that would include a CD that is a compact disc with certain drink purchases. The compact disc would fit into the lid of a gargantuan-sized soft drink cup, which I'm sure was marketed as a small, and the idea was that you would pop off the lid, take out the CD, and then you could discover new music, presumably by playing the CD, if you can just discover it by looking at one, your eyes are lasers and you're a robot. We had some of these lid rock lids around the office when I first started at How Stuff Works. It was an, a subject of some jovial conversation at points in the editorial department. Now, I joined HowStuffWorks.com in 2007, and that was when it was still owned by the Convex Group. So I have some interesting memories of, of this time. I was actually part of the staff. Anyway, the Convex Group bought How Stuff Works with the goal of selling it for a profit further down the road. This was not a secret. It was not like it was coming as a shock to anyone. It was pretty much part of the deal when the Convex Group made the acquisition in 2002. It's just it took a few years to get to the point where they could sell it for a really good profit. In the meantime, the website grew. Now, there was a time before I was hired where things seemed really interesting to me. Now, I never got to experience this firsthand. I just got to hear about this time, this wondrous, magical, mythical time before I got hired on. Uh, there used to be a branch of the How Stuff Works site called Stuffo. And this was meant to cover more whimsical and lighthearted topics, largely entertainment related topics. How Stuff Works was thought to be more serious. It was going to explain stuff like refrigerators and computers and world finance. And Stuffo would answer really weird questions, such as who would win in a fight, Superman or a Jedi? Stuffo existed from 2004 to about 2006. And from what I heard, it was a lot of fun to work on, but it wasn't to last. By the time I was brought on, Stuffo was gone, and the the editorial staff of How Stuff Works itself had been through a really rough patch. All of the full-time writers, except for one, were gone. There was one remaining full-time writer when I was brought on. That one full-time staff writer was Tracy V. Wilson. Now, she's a host of Stuff You Missed in History class. That might be where you're familiar with Tracy, but I had known Tracy from before I started How Stuff Works, I actually was a writer on a series of things that Tracy would also occasionally write for, and that's how we knew each other. So I applied to work for How Stuff Works in late 2006, got an interview in early 2007, and was hired on February 15th, 2007. At that time, Tracy and I were the only two full-time staff writers, with Julia Layton writing Questions of the Day. And we'll talk more about that in our interview with Allison Lowermilk, the managing editor of How Stuff Works, in just a few moments. Now, a few months after I joined, the company began to reinvest in the editorial department. So it had gone through a dip where a lot of the people were either 
uh, laid off or people left the job to go and do something else. And Tracy and I were the only two there. Uh, but they then switched where there was this reinvestment and the department began to grow. And we started to hire new writers and editors. And some of those people are folks that you might be familiar with, such as Josh Clark and Chuck Bryant. They came in on that first wave. So I was here first. I want that noted. These days they do host Stuff You Should Know, a podcast of some renown. I do not begrudge them their success. They're actually amazing. They are talented. They are funny. They are wicked smart. And so they are uh, fantastic co-workers and great podcasters. Now, in October 2007, this was less than a year after I had started at the company, we got the announcement that Discovery Communications, that is the company behind the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, TLC, and more, was going to buy How Stuff Works. And the generally agreed upon estimate for the sales price, because these things are not always public, was $250 million. That's a pretty nice profit for that million dollar investment that was made back in 2002. Let me also explain what life was like back then for, uh, the writers of How Stuff Works, not in general. I mean, 2007 wasn't that long ago. You could probably remember it yourself. But if you were a writer in 2007, particularly when Tracy and I were writing, we would write one article every two weeks and we would just alternate. By the time Discovery was purchasing us, we had switched to writing an article every week. And we then had more writers and more editors so we could actually publish more than one article every week. Because back in the day, if you went to HowStuffWorks.com and you looked at that front page, there would only be one new article every single week. If you went back the next day, there might be different articles listed on the homepage, but they were all previously written. They weren't new. So this was a, a moment where we were transforming that, where we were trying to generate a an entire web page's worth or an entire landing page's worth of new content every week which was a, a big challenge. It was, a, it was ramping up quite a bit, and it put a lot of pressure on us as writers and editors. Now, How Stuff Works was intended to become a digital arm of Discovery Communications, and on the surface, it looked like it was going to be a really good fit because the content on Discovery was all about asking interesting questions and finding out the answers, which is, if you hadn't figured it out, what How Stuff Works is all about, too. And there were a lot of cool opportunities that popped up due to Discovery being the owner of the company. So sometimes people had the opportunity to write for a television show or even appear on one. And uh, there were also some things that were perhaps a little less positive, but that's to be expected with any major change in a company. It's not unique to how stuff works. This was also, of course, during a time at Discovery when the channels began to create some content that met with, let's say, mixed reactions, such as specials about mermaids and megalodons that seemed to be documentaries, but were in fact fiction. That was a fun thing to live through and write for. Under Discovery, House of Works would also launch a new business, Podcasts. Now, we're going to talk more about that in episode 901, but the major podcasts that we launched back in 2008 would be Stuff You Should Know, Stuff You Missed in History Class, which was originally called Fact or Fiction, and, of course, Tech Stuff. And, and Marshall Brain also launched a short-form podcast called Brain Stuff. From 2008 until 2014, How Stuff Works was part of the Discovery Communications family, and we produced podcasts and videos on top of continuing to write articles about all sorts of topics. For a while, writers specialized in specific content categories, and I was asked and accepted uh, to become deemed the head writer for computers and electronics because everyone else was scared of them. We're all a bunch of English lit majors, but I argued that technology meant I had the easiest job of everybody because here's a secret. Technology either works or it doesn't. So you just learn how it works and you explain it and you're done. Whereas if you're covering any of those fuzzy social things, it gets way more messy and complicated. Josh, Chuck, Robert Lamb, and uh, yours truly became senior writers at that time. And we helped shape the editorial voice and the direction of the website. We experimented with creating new experiences 
such as with Android and iOS apps, and we collaborated with other parts of the Discovery Digital Network. By 2014, Discovery's strategy for digital was changing. The company began to sell off or shut down various divisions within their digital network. It wasn't just How Stuff Works, it also was SourceFed and others. And they decided to sell How Stuff Works. The company that bought How Stuff Works was called Blue Cora, and it paid a reported $45 million for the site, which was obviously a huge drop in price, an 82% drop in price, in fact, from what Discovery had paid back in 2008. So I'm going to be real here. It was not easy to go through this transition. For one thing, when you see the company you love and work for sell for so much less than what it was valued just a few years earlier, that's hard to take. And most of us had no idea what Blue Cora even did. Some of us still don't. What it did do, mainly, is own other companies, like Infospace. Infospace is one of those companies that has its own really complicated history, including a fairly shady past at one point, though the company of today does not resemble that older one at all. And maybe one day I'll do a full episode on the Infospace story, because it is interesting, and it is tumultuous, and the company has emerged from that past and has done incredible work. How Stuff Works was meant to complement Infospace, which focused on search business. So they would do search advertising and search optimization. How Stuff Works would end up being a great pairing. That was the logic. How Stuff Works would create content. Infospace would at leverage its expertise with search to help How Stuff Works take advantage of that search power, and it would become a mutually beneficial relationship. But then Blue Cora in 2016 began to focus more on financial services and less on internet search. As the parent company's goals began to change, it became clear to the business owners that Infospace and with it, How Stuff Works, didn't really have a place at the table anymore. Now, this is particularly interesting to me because Infospace created Blue Cora as a holding company. So Infospace created Blue Cora, then eventually Blue Cora says, you know what, we don't need Infospace anymore. This is kind of similar to how Google created Alphabet to be a holding company, a parent company for all of the Google sub companies. And so Blue Cora began to look for a company that might want to purchase Infospace and also take How Stuff Works along for the ride. That company would be one called OpenMail. And yeah, this is really is a crazy, complicated story. I know because I, I lived through all of this. Anyway, OpenMail LLC was a data management and marketing technology company, which purchased both Infospace and How Stuff Works for $45 million. Which also stung, because now the company that was purchased two years previously for $45 million was being sold with another much larger company for a combined price of $45 million. OpenMail would later rebrand itself into System One, and in August 2017, System One announced it was going to spin off How Stuff Works as an independent company. And that's where we are now. In that time, Connell Byrne has been my boss twice. He joined How Stuff Works in 2007, a few months after I started, and he headed up the company for several years until Discovery sold How Stuff Works to Blue Cora. And then we parted ways. Then, as How Stuff Works became an independent company in 2017, he returned, and now he's the boss again. So that's kind of interesting. Now, I've got a whole lot more to say about How Stuff Works, the company, but first, you guessed it, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor. With exponential knowledge and technology, you can realize exponential outcomes. This is you to the power of IBM. Find out more at ibm.com slash you. All right, we're back. Now I'd like to switch over to an interview I did earlier with Allison Laudermilk, the managing editor of How Stuff Works, to talk about the voice of the site and how things have changed over the years. I am joined in the studio by Allison Laudermilk, the managing editor over at HowStuffWorks.com. Allison, I invited you here so that we could talk about the experience of working for How Stuff Works, as well as the uh, the sort of stuff you do as managing editor and kind of how the site itself has changed a little bit over time. We try to keep a consistent voice 
for the the website so that we can have that sort of throughput. But it's uh, there are little things around the edges that change. So first off, how would you describe how stuff works as voice to somebody if you were telling them and they had never visited the website and you said, well, you know, it's it's a reference site. It's got tons of information about all sorts of topics. How would you describe the tone or the voice of the, the site? Jonathan, that's a great question. And it's something we think about a lot on the editorial team. Um, I think the most important thing to recognize about the the folks who are here editing and writing for How Stuff Works is that we are a curious bunch. Mm -hmm. And so we let our innate wonder of the world really drive what we're talking about. Um, we are always curious and we are always trying to get to the bottom of something. Um, and that can drive the conversation let's take let's take what's going on in the world today. Uh, there's a lot of political things. Sure. House of Works has not always has not traditionally been a, a political site, but we will try to find the story, the explainer behind the politics. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that process work? Does a president have to live in the White House? Like, things like that. Um, so we're always trying to look for the bigger picture of something that's happening behind the news. We started out very science and technically uh, focused. Our big article, as I'm smiling right here and I'm waiting for you to recognize it, is how car engines work. I mean, that's that's the big one. That's the legendary how stuff works biggie. And we've gone on to do thousands and thousands of articles since then. And what has remained consistent over all of those articles is the curiosity. And it's, it's, it shouldn't be superficial. We strive to never be superficial, but rather we're trying to get underneath and dig. I mean, are there scientific forces at work? Mm. What is the theory? What, are, what, what is the research out there um, that has you know, investigated the topic at hand? We try to go for primary sources. We are factual. Uh, we try as much as we can to be unbiased. But of course, we're coming from a certain point of view. So sure. There is so much you can do on that front. Well, and I, I like to describe it sort of as, uh, you know, you're chatting with a super smart friend of yours at like a restaurant or something or, you know, some casual environment. So it doesn't come across necessarily professorial, right? It's not like a lecture. It's it's not dry like a, a, a typical reference book would be, but it's also not as flippant as some other sites might be, there's a, there's a middle ground there. So, and, and I'm not trying to dismiss or, or talk trash about sites that are more, uh, uh, you know, they, they add more humor into their, their work. I think there is value in that. That's just not the voice of how stuff works. There's a little bit, but it's not like, and this is the setup for a jokey joke. And now we'll throw in a fact or two. Uh, there's some, a delicate, line in between. That's the way I always felt that, uh, you know, you wanted to feel like the article is taking you uh, and treating you as an equal as the reader, right? Like we're not talking down to anybody. We're not trying to uh, to come across as we're, we are the great oracle and you shall kneel before us and we will bestow our wisdom and knowledge upon you and you will be better for it, but still less than us and go away now. That's not the way we wanted to have How Stuff Works come across. And uh, so it was always a challenge for me as a writer to find the elements in a, a, an assignment that got me interested, you know, engage that, that sense of curiosity you were talking about and would therefore energize me to write the whole piece. And sometimes, actually, more frequently than not, the ones that I found more inspiring were topics that I initially thought were going to be terrible. Like what? Can you give us an example? I mean, let's see. Let the, I'll, I'll think about that. Like, gosh, I wrote so many and it's been so long since I've written any. But like I, I wrote some about cloud computing when cloud computing was still a buzz term that not very many people understood. And I was worried that it was just going to be super dry and really technical and that there wouldn't be anything interesting about it. And the more I learned about it, the more I thought this is actually pretty fascinating, the way this architecture works, the whole concept of it, the fact that we call it a cloud, but really your your information is still living on a computer. In fact, it's living on several computers, typically, if you have redundancy built in. I'm not going to go into that. I've done full episodes about it, but I found it very interesting, whereas there would be other ones that maybe I thought going into it, oh, I can't wait to write about this. And then maybe two pages into the article, I thought, ooh, this is going to be harder than I imagined, because even though I was excited at the beginning, 
when I start looking into it, either there is a lack of compelling information out there for you to write a sizable article, or you just haven't found the right, the right entry point. And uh, one of the ways we try to prepare ourselves when we're getting ready to to start an article is we send out uh, an initial approach, which it's is a very fun process. Yeah, uh, it's a fun process that Jonathan Strickland is infamous for ignoring. Uh, the the initial approach, though, that's typically where we create a list of questions we feel the article should answer. Uh, most of the time, sometimes it's something else. Like it may be like we've got this idea for a list of really important examples of a particular category. There's one that went around just recently. They got a lot of feedback. Sure did. And uh, and in that case, it just ends up being people listing examples. You're not going to tell the I listeners? mean, I guess I could, right? I mean, it's so I think the, you the one I'm talking about right now where uh, it was <laughs> – it was – uh, it was musicals that are uh, that were particularly important for the the art form of musical theater, right? And so people started. It was more activity than I'd seen in quite a while, and, and honestly, and I actually engaged in this one. Uh, I argue that the Fantastics should be on that list because it was the longest running off Broadway musical of all time, and therefore. Uh, it deserves a, a place on that list. Also, Jerry Orbach was in that, and he's amazing. So that sort of thing, you get those initial approaches. But most of the time, our initial approaches are questions that we think the article should answer. And I love that process because it shows it shows kind of how everyone thinks based upon the questions they tend to submit. So let me give you a, a classic Tracy Submission. Tracy Tra- V. Wilson, that Tracy is. Tracy V. Wilson, one of the co-hosts of Stuff You Missed in History class. She, uh, I believe now, is the most senior of all How Stuff Works employees. I think that she's got, she's been here the longest of everybody. Um, and she was, when I joined, one of the, the only other staff writer on staff. She oh, and I can, were the only two. Yeah, you can find a ton of her articles still on the site. Yeah. Everything from how dinosaurs work to all sorts of stuff. Uh, I remember she was working on um, Silly String when I first started. And I remember magnets almost broke her brain. How magnets work almost broke. It, I mean, let's be fair. The insane clown posse couldn't figure it out. But Tracy, she sat down. She finally, you know, she was able to suss it out at the end. And so that article does exist. But something that Tracy is is very much known for is if you have any sort of article that has any sort of remotely scientific aspect to it, she will submit the question of what are the physics that guide this or what is the science behind this? Like if the questions, if none of the questions that are on the list already, because you usually as a writer or editor come up with a list of them and you submit it to everybody else and then you say, what else am I not thinking of? If you have not included that science-based aspect, don't worry. She'll she'll definitely submit that. Uh, it's kind of her, her go-to. I have one that's stuck in my head. Um, and I think maybe even Chuck, Chuck Bryant made the joke when it went out and it was about kayaking and we were going to write how kayaking works. And I think he jokingly submitted to the initial approach email thread. Well, don't forget about the science of kayaking. Yeah. Like, ha ha. And sure enough, there's Tracy chiming in on that. Yeah. I mean, fluid dynamics, right? I mean, come on. That's an important part of physics. So, yeah, it's it's we joke about it a little bit because there is this sort of culture here at how stuff works that, you know, you, you, when you're immersed in it, you begin to really get a sense of, of what is important to each person based upon the kind of questions that they typically will submit. Not all of them are falling into exactly the same category. It's not like, Oh, well, here comes the pop culture question from so-and-so because they're the pop culture person. It's not quite that, specific, but uh, it is kind of funny to see those sort of submissions. I think the big thing about How Stuff Works is that we trust the readers to understand any subject. We think that we are able to explain it, and we think readers should be able um we think that our readers are smart enough um, to understand it, too. And I mean, that can be everything from particle accelerators to kayaking, like we were just talking about. We put the onus on the writers and the editors to explain the subject in a way that people can appreciate. And I think that I think that everybody should be able to ask questions about the world and have them answered. And that's really what we're about. Right, right. And we we don't want as writers or editors 
to walk away from an article with a question unanswered, if in fact there is an answer for that question, because that means someone out there is going to ask it and the article didn't answer it. And that means that we failed on our part in this in this process. This is a relationship that we've built with our audience. And, uh, you know, we try our best to make sure that we are we have a, a representative list of questions that we think this article needs to answer. Sometimes that does fall through, but we also will go back and we'll edit articles and include more information uh, in order to address that when it's when it's appropriate. So it's you know, it's it's an interesting relationship. Uh, and speaking of those, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with the company. When did you start at How Stuff Works? I started in January 2008 and I started with a whole group of people. Um, Kristen Conger, uh, she was formerly the host of Stuff Mom Never Told You. Molly mm -hmm. Edmonds, they mm -hmm. were the original two on that. Amanda Arnold, she was an editor uh, a long time for The Adventure, a really great soul. Um, also, Jennifer Horton, she was for a little bit, she had a shorter stay with How Stuff Works. And I'm trying to remember who else. There was somebody else. There were six of us. Was there? Uh, it wouldn't have been Toothman. She was later, right? Jessica Toothman. Jessica Toothman, one of our in-house writers. Yeah. So to give you an idea of how long I've been with the company, I started when my daughter was seven months old, and I am now still with the company, and she is 10. Yeah. So a long yeah. time. I had been with How Stuff Works for a little less than a year when you came on, and uh, I was just thinking, who are these upstarts coming in on <laughs> coming in on my playground? Gosh darn it. No, I was excited because, again, like when I started, it was just two staff writers, Tracy and myself, and that was it. In fact, when I started, so when I started at How Stuff Works, we had one article, one full-length article go up every week, which meant that we each, Tracy and I, had two weeks to research, write, submit, rewrite uh, any article, and then it would go up, you know, that following, like, the Friday, and then two weeks later, the next one that we would write would go up on that Friday in two weeks. So we alternated. Tracy would have one week. I would have another week. But having two weeks to research, write, and refine an article was amazing. It was a huge amount of time. And uh, there's a there's a, a joking law. It's kind of like, um, you know, how you you have all these different supposed rules that kind of guide the universe, but really it's just us kind of making stuff up. One of those says that the amount of work you have will fill up whatever time it is that you have available to it. It doesn't matter how short or long the time is. It's, it could be the exact same amount of work or the same output. But if you have two weeks to do it, it'll take two weeks to get it done. If you have 45 minutes to do it, it'll take 45 minutes to get it done. Uh, we had two weeks to write an article, and it was a, a single article per person. We also had another person who was writing questions of the day, which were super short. Those were you know, one page, typically. Julia Layton. Julia Layton, who would write one page articles uh, uh, that would try and answer a basic but interesting question. And that actually has been a throughput for how stuff works as well. We've had that kind of approach of we've got this question that we just want to know the answer to. Let's assign that to someone and find out what the answer is, because that's kind of a cool thing. And we've done that in podcasts. We've done that in articles. We've done it in blog posts. Uh, but things have changed since then. When you joined, it, by then, it had already changed a little bit. Sure. People were really excited because we, the discovery acquisition had been announced and uh, shortly thereafter uh, was completed. So there's a lot of excitement around that. Yeah, there was a lot of trepidation, but also excitement because suddenly we were going to be part of a much larger media company. Uh, we weren't entirely certain how that was going to play out, but it ended up being really an interesting experience. And I mean, you know, everyone says, oh, you use the word interesting and that can be neither good or bad. Both happened. I mean, there were good things with the discovery relationship. There were things that were not so good, depending upon where in the hierarchy you were, right? So uh, one of the examples of something that might have been a little frustrating was that we would occasionally get requests to write or record information about some related discovery topic. And that put the challenge on us to find a way to do it where it didn't just come across as an advertisement for a discovery show. And uh, sometimes that was not so hard because Discovery covers a lot of stuff that is very much aligned with the sort of things that How Stuff Works covers. 
Sometimes it was more challenging where you really, the, the request was, well, it's essentially going to be, this is going to be about the show. There's not much I can do about it other than to make sure I do the best job I possibly can creating this piece of content so that it serves both the site and discovery properly. Uh, and that's always delicate. I assume that, uh, you know, you came in right at the beginning of that relationship. I'm sure there were times during it that were more challenging than others. Yeah, Robert and I worked on this show, produced pieces uh, for the this awesome series called Life. And it was an adaptation of the Attenborough um, BBC a series that they'd done. And it was a lot of fun. And he got to interview uh, some of the directors and main characters involved. And it was super interesting stuff, which is mm. all about very, very close to how stuff works core, just um, questions about animals and how the world works and uh, the ecosystem and the, you know, the inner workings. It was it was very fun. We enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, that was great. There were other times where, and I mean, I'm just going to speak frankly here because it's my show. Uh, but there were other times that were probably a little more of a head scratcher, at least for me, things like walking into a meeting and another conference call is still kind of going on, but it wasn't being concluded. And so we had this weird kind of mixture of people inside the room. And I remember hearing an actual conversation about the ramifications of John and Kate divorcing uh, for the whole John and Kate plus eight show and hearing executives talking about how that was going to affect business deals. And it just, it, that's when it hit me. I thought, I don't, I don't want to be in this room right now. I want to get out of this room and then I'll come back when this conversation is over because it didn't have anything to do with me. That was not part of what I was working on at all. But it was one of those little reminders that sometimes these relationships have downsides from a from a writer's perspective. If you like, again, we were all trying to serve how stuff works first and also serve discovery because discovery owned how stuff works at the time. Uh, and it wasn't always an easy thing to do. Uh, I remember Julie Douglas um, of Stuff of Life and just a really all around great producer right now. She, I remember hearing her in the cube over interviewing Michelle Duggar, mm -hmm. and that was always interesting. Yeah, yeah, we had some, uh, you know, we we had some little rough spots there. We also, uh, I mean, there's no secret that the way the web works is through web advertising, and we had some really big uh, deals with various uh, manufacturers, companies that were wanting to advertise on how stuff works, and they were very, very good, big deals, but. Early on, we had not really created the strategy for how to do that in a way that was responsible so that we wouldn't uh, end up alienating our own user base, our own audience. So there were some some uh, tough learning curves there. Like yeah, I, it was the dawn of sponsored content for How Stuff Works. Um, yeah. And a lot of other people had started doing it and how to do it right and exactly what you're saying, how to balance the editorial calendar so that we are serving a lot of different stakeholder needs. Yeah. And you didn't want to have a moment where someone visits the website and it's just absolutely dominated by a single topic because then you start thinking, what topic I might that be? Trailer yeah. hitches? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about towing. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't necessarily going to say it, but yes, how towing works. Oh, man, I had to write maybe uh, eight or nine articles about towing. And um, again, this was one of those things where we had made a promise to an advertiser. I mean, it was all it all made sense on paper. The problem was that in actual practice, it became very challenging to do because you realize, well, if if we go down this road too far, it starts becoming like a content farm where we're just churning out like low quality content in order to meet a demand from an advertiser. But that in turn is not going to necessarily be of much value to our readers. Uh, we never, I never felt like we actually went down that way. I never felt I don't think we, so either. I think we did some high quality uh, towing articles. It, I mean, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's funny to say, but I mean, like we took that seriously. We, we did. did. We did not want to have an article go out that we did not feel proud of, even in challenging circumstances where you're thinking like, I don't, I don't want to write the same article five times, but this this topic is very similar to the one I just finished. You, it was it made a challenge as a writer to create an article that would be 
just as compelling or just as interesting or just as informative, certainly just as accurate as all the others. It was, you know, we after that, we got a lot better at figuring out how to present these packages so that we could serve all of the customers, if you will, uh, the way they needed to be, so that we could make sure that we were delivering information that our readers were going to find interesting, that they would find helpful, uh, that we were going to create opportunities for the advertisers to be able to show their ads against something that they were comfortable with, that they were uh, you know, proud of, and and something that we felt, again, didn't betray the spirit and voice of how stuff works. And so it took a little while. Like I said, it was a rocky start, but shortly after that, uh, there were certain certain big topics that for a while you didn't want to say out loud in the How Stuff Works office. Uh, towing would be one of them. Skin clean cleansers was another we big one. We did a one. lot of skincare articles. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, no, I, I wrote one. I'll, I'll tell, let me tell an embarrassing story about myself. Please do. With writing. So Jonathan sometimes has reading comprehension issues, uh, it turns out, especially in email, because there was... Uh, a, l- a list of assignments that went out. Actually, I think this was in a spreadsheet. There was a list of assignments that went out about skin cleansers. And there were two very, very, very similar article titles. Uh, one was about skin cleansers, and one was about a very re- much related topic, but it wasn't skin cleansers. It was some other skincare type of product. But both of them were supposed to be five top five gluten-free Blah, no blah, way. Blah. We were oh, talking yes. about gluten-free back then? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I got, uh, first of all, multiple multiple issues I had with the article. But but one, the, the one that I made the mistake on, I'll get that out of the way, is I wrote the wrong article. I, I, I wrote one that Josh Clark had been assigned. He got, because we, there were two articles, like I said, that had very similar titles. I grabbed Josh's. And Josh also wrote Josh's as Josh should have done. Uh, And so we actually had two top five gluten-free skin cleanser articles come out. And the one I was supposed to write, which was also a gluten-free skincare thing, but it wasn't cleansers. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I never wrote. They just decided not to have me write that one, probably because my page zero, which is our, our landing page, our first page that people would see if they went to the article, explained why a gluten-free skin cleanser was totally not necessary in the first place. Because you don't absorb gluten through the skin, you can, it's, the molecules are too big, you have to ingest it. So unless you're eating your skin cleanser, the issues you have with gluten would not be a problem with these products. Therefore, the list is superfluous. And I have a feeling that that attitude probably meant that they didn't want me to write the real article later. I, I can't blame them. And is that batch of articles the uh, the ones that gave your skin its current ros- rosy glow? Oh yeah, that <laughs> that and just the fact that I'm I'm practicing. Uh, I my plan is that when I'm I'm ready to retire, I'm gonna segue into uh, being Santa Claus. So I want to make sure I have those rosy cheeks going when I get there. So it's just it's it's a gradual. I, I don't want it to be a shocking transformation. So I'm planning ahead now. And we're just going to very gradually get there. But I'm going to be a really buff Santa Claus because I'm also, you know, I'm you working know hard and working hard. Um, so tell me a little bit about like how you've seen the site kind of change since you started. Uh, obviously, we've gone through different corporate owners and that has been a big part of it. But just uh, your your experience as being an editor, how has that evolved over the years? Well, the mode of storytelling has changed. I think that's a really important thing to note, uh, just as other publishers have embraced different forms of uh, telling a story, we have as well. Mm-hmm. I think we're truly multimedia now. And most importantly is podcasts. Back mm-hmm. in the day, we had we started podcasts. Uh, Jerry was here and the original Stuff You Missed in History class with Candice and before and stuff you should know when that all started. I mean, that was a long time ago. And the video guys were always here. I, I should yeah. say video team. Um, they were always here doing wacky stuff. I remember Tyler, one of our producers now and now an audio engineer, correct? Yep. He, uh, I remember him walking around in that green suit in the office. Oh, yeah. We had him in the uh, the green man suit. Yeah, we did this thing where it was uh, the invisible man does something. And so we would shoot Tyler against a green screen, key him out entirely, 
and then you have an invisible man thing. But once in a while, you just walk around the office. There's Tyler in the green man suit going around. Yeah. So we've had a couple more avenues of storytelling open up. And my job as an editor is to figure out what the best experience is. What should draw? Like what, what is the story and what's the best way to tell it? Who is mm-hmm. the best person to tell it? Who's the best editor? When, when should it go out? How much space do we need to give this topic to breathe? Should it be short? Do we need to get this out today? Because we really need it to be part of the conversation. Or do we need to give it a little bit more time and space and, and thought? Um, when you were talking before, Jonathan, about how you had about two weeks to write that article, there is very much a conversation going on right now about a return to slow journalism, if you will, mm. that the pace of articles is too fast and that we should be more careful and just pay articles their proper due in terms of time and space and word count and sources and all of that stuff. So in a weird way, a lot of these things have come full circle. It's still about the story, and it's just about the best way to tell it. Mm -hmm. Um, And staying true to the How Stuff Works voice, those are really the important things. So, I mean, right now, you know, we can embed a podcast. Hey, we're doing something about artificial intelligence. Great. I know a guy who has covered (laughs) artificial intelligence a lot. I'm going to grab a podcast here, and I think... If somebody's interested in listening to a little bit about it, like, great, they'll be able to read it, they'll be able to hear it, whatever way they learn best, they will be able to get information about this topic that is mm-hmm. relevant to their lives. One, well, and uh, to your point about the slow journalism thing, like when we, when I started, the goal for How Stuff Works was that we were, every piece of content we were creating, apart from the, well, even questions of the day, really, they were all supposed to be evergreen, right? These were all topics that would be something that someone three or four years from now would go back and be able to read and it would be just as relevant to them. Obviously, once they made me the uh, the head writer for the technology channels, I realized how impossible a task that is for technology because things just change so quickly. If you want any proof, go back and read any of the computer articles on HowStuffWorks.com and just look at the little technical specs that are get that get thrown out as examples because... You'll sit there and if you start seeing processor speeds listed in the megahertz instead of the gigahertz, you're like, wow, when was this article written? Like, Well, probably more than a decade ago. Um, but I mean, the the foundation of the article is still absolutely accurate. It's just that the details have changed because the the scale of technology has changed so much. But uh, that was sort of the goal, right? We wanted to make sure that the articles we were writing were things that weren't so... Uh, mercurial that by the time we are ready to submit an article, the the facts of the matter had already changed, therefore necessitating a revisit to what we had just written. Uh, then we've gone through phases like we did uh, How Stuff Works Now for a while, where we were mu- it was much more rapid turnaround. It wasn't quite breaking news. We weren't we weren't investigative journalists or anything like that. We're giving more context to things that were in you know, kind of in the conversation in the news, uh, very much the way Tech Stuff Daily is. If if any of my listeners have listened to Tech Stuff Daily, that's kind of a Tech Stuff version of that same idea where we take things that are kind of being talked about and give more context around it. But it's not in itself a breaking news show. That was that we're just not set up for that. That's not the way we work. We don't our our we're not news. No, our publishing tools wouldn't support it. Uh, you know, our publishing tools aren't meant to support that. Uh, our editorial process is not meant to do that. Uh, so seeing this return kind of to the slow journalism, I think that that whether that happens or not, I think that that certainly plays more to the strengths of what we built this company around. Um, not that I think that there's no value in giving context to breaking stories. I think there is. But it just it's just a it's more challenging based on the tools that we have at our disposal than the kind of traditional, I'm going to really break down how X works and and really understand it at a fundamental level and then explain it. Um, do you remember what it was like interviewing for How Stuff Works when you first came in? I do. I very much do. Uh, this is funny. It was right around, so I came on in January 2008, as I said before. So my interviews, I kind of just sent in my resume on a whim. I applied for the writer position and I had just finished my master's at UGA in communicate, mass communications. Mm-hmm. 
And I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll try, try my hand at this writer thing. And Tracy saw my resume and she gave me a shout and she said, hey, why don't you, why don't you try out for the, the editor position? Which, thank you, Tracy. That proved to be a really good move. <laughs> thank you, Tracy V. Wilson. Um, and so I came in and it was right before the holidays and I interviewed, I interviewed with uh, Katie, who used to be our old health editor. Clambert. Yes. Yes. And she was the one who originally uh, coined me a loud. Right. She right. did. Uh, I interviewed with Connell. I interviewed with Tracy. I remember sitting in Connell's office, and this is sort of embarrassing, and also not, and, and like talking to him across his big desk, and he has the classic corner office, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to get your job someday. <laughs> and I kind of did. Yeah, you kind of did. It's funny because Connell was part of the company for a long time. Then he was not. And now he is again. He sure is. He's heading up that fantastic podcast biz we got going on. Yep. Yep. So it's great hearing that story. I remember when I, I came on, uh, it was very similar, uh, although uh, different people. Connell had not yet joined the company when I when I was hired. Um, but, yeah, thinking back on that now, I remember sitting down and having this discussion. And then I think the thing that maybe sealed the deal for me, it's hard to say because obviously I wasn't in on those conversations, was that I said, listen, if you guys don't hire me, I'm this is kind of what I do anyway. Like I like to learn things and then I like to talk about the stuff I learned with people. And then you like to talk. Yeah, I know it really comes through as a shock. Uh, the guy who has all the solo podcast stuff is, uh, shows, but yeah, I, I said like, this is what I, I love to do. And if I were hired here, I get to do it for a living. And that's fortunately how it worked out. It's the job for me changed dramatically over the years. There was originally, like I said, I had two weeks to research and write an article. Eventually that got knocked down to one week to research and write an article. Then it became one week to research, write an article, and a companion article. A yeah, but you never had article. to find the pictures. You never had to upload them. Oh, you no, had I, the best uh, editor that, ever. That, no, once Chris became my editor, yes. But I had other editors before Chris because I had Candace and I had Shanna. And uh, yeah, I had I had editors where I had to find all that stuff. Oh, but goodness. once I got Chris, yes, I was on easy street. Yeah, you were. You were hooked up by Chris. Chris Chris Paulette, let me tell you. All right, you guys who have listened to this show for a long time, you know who Chris Paulette is. He was my original co-host. Chris Paulette, uh, as an editor, was a writer's dream come true because I would submit a draft to Chris. He would do all the work to get all the images. He would write the captions for the images. He would do all the edits himself. Like if there were any problems with the article, yo, he'd solve it. And I only occasionally would get an article back where he'd have a question like, hey, could you explain this a bit more? Like that was so rare. It was essentially I would hand it off to him and I was done. I could go on to the next thing. Um, I'm not just saying this because I'm on your show. Uh, your copy is generally pretty clean. I will say that as an editor. That's that's good to know. I still occasionally have trouble with passive voice. I got really good at knocking passive voice out of my writing for a really long time, but then I went for a good stretch without writing. <laughs> and then passive voice crept back in. Uh, so what what excites you about working at How Stuff Works? Like when you think about your job, what is it the what what's the stuff that brings you great joy? The people here. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've got some topics. great people. Uh, really working with the the team I do and, and the topics. Um, when we first moved to the Atlanta area, uh, early 2000s, I moved with my then fiance and he was taking a job at CDC. And I had a lot of respect for CDC and really thought I would go into health communications and sort of my dream job was to work at the Centers for Disease Control in some sort of communication role. Mm -hmm. And... I have since come to realize that How Stuff Works is a very unique place to work in that you never know what we're going to be talking about. It has made my life and my world perspective so much bigger than it was. I think, honestly, it's helped me be a better parent. It makes me ask questions about things. And my kids, like, I will constantly ask them things about well, how does that work? I mean, all of my friends tease me. They're like, yeah, how does that work, Allison? I mean, we all get that question from sure, all, yeah. of our, all of our peeps. Oh, yeah. No, whenever we have any kind of technical glitch 
here at the office, like let's say the the internet connection goes down, then immediately you know you're going to get lots of people making jokes about how we should be able to fix everything. Uh, sometimes things are outside of our control. Sometimes you have to really chase down where a problem is. But ultimately, you also have to remember, we spend intense amount of time researching and writing and editing these things. And then we have to turn around and do something totally different, another completely different topic, sometimes, sometimes radically different topic. And you can only hold on to so much information for so long before you are starting to overwrite old information. Like people will talk to me about an article I wrote back in like 2010. Like, Listen, though that data is gone. <laughs> if I held on to any of it, it's just through the fact that I never got around to overriding that particular little sector of my brain. Uh, but yeah, like you say, the people here are great. We've had some amazing folks work here. Some, many of them still working here, but like throughout the years, we've had a lot of talented writers and editors and illustrators and uh, podcasters and videographers, like just so many amazing people, some of whom still work in this building, just not at this company. Yeah. Yeah. We run, run into some of them occasionally because they work right down the hall. It's just kind of cool. And we'll reminisce. So uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have you on to kind of have this personal touch with how stuff works. You know, the, the whole episodes 900 and 901, I wanted to make sure uh, kind of gave a, a feel for what this, this entire experience is like for us on this side, you know, the, the people who are working so hard to try and create really interesting content based on things that we personally find fascinating. And, and that covers the entire spectrum of the human experience from the cosmological to the microscopic to you know, fashion to finance, all of that is fascinating. And uh, for those of you out there who have never gone to HowStuffWorks.com. I'm sure there are some of you who've only experienced this through the podcast. I urge you to go to HowStuffWorks.com and, you know, poke around a bit, see some, read some articles, check out some stuff that you're interested in. Do you, do you, Allison, I, I hate to spring this on you. Do you have a, a favorite article? I have a lot of favorites. Yeah. I do. Um, Honestly, I'm going to say that this article that Eve's Jeffcoat, an editor, and now she's uh, moved to the podcast side, wrote, or she edited, and uh, Ed Grab, who's a longtime writer, and oh, yeah. he, he wrote it, and it's on how nepotism works. And Let's be fair. Ed got his nephew to write that. <laughs> nice one. Um, I thought it was just classic how stuff works in that I thought the topic would be pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Nepotism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of a bad thing. And then Ed got into really the history of nepotism and how, you know, you have these forces that are opposing. You have, um, you know, sort of you have non-nepotism and you have nepotism. You have a smooth transition to power that's occurring if you're passing power to, say, your son. Right. And you sort of have this eroding faith in the public and the public institutions if you get nepotism too heavy. But anyway, the whole point of the story is that this article really did more than just a superficial treatment. He got in there and he talked about it and he talked about the popes. Actually, mm -hmm. it sprang from uh, the Latin for nephew because the popes wanted to have uh, some way to recognize their illegitimate sons. And mm -hmm. so they used to pass on um, prime positions within the church to uh, to their to their people. Right. To their to their their uh, their sons that they could not actually publicly acknowledge because. One of the things about being Pope, you know, not supposed to yeah. have a whole parcel of kids, at least not later on in the uh, in, in Catholicism. Yeah, that's great. I mean, like I, I sit there and try and think about my favorites like I. There's there's one that I have a favorite because of how frequently Connell would reference it. Because I just think it was funny that that was his go to article to reference whenever he talked about like an article about something cool, which was quantum suicide. Oh, yeah, he did. He but talked about quantum suicide all the time. Quantum suicide was like the phrase from Connell. Like if you wanted to talk about, like, yeah, well, you know, we write cool articles like, you know, quantum suicide. If, yeah. Connell, you know, we've got like a thousand other articles on the site. But yes, Josh did a great job with quantum suicide. I don't want to take anything away. It's really great. But um, for my own personal favorite. I wrote so many that I really loved. I, You're still I loved, writing. 
Uh, yeah, Here I do. I do, but but not as frequently. But I, I'll go to a classic one. Like there were ones about the Necronomicon and Cthulhu that I had a lot of fun writing. But the one that I think is my favorite out of all of them, and it was one I had to fight for, was how Area 51 works. And uh, the reason I had to fight for it was not because of the topic. That was that was a sign to me. We had decided we wanted to do it. I wrote it. But I included so many different sections that were outside of just the base, the Groom Lake base part of that discussion. I included things about the community around it and the various conspiracy theories that popped up around it and the culture around Area 51. And to me, that was also just as fascinating as all the top secret stuff. And I got a little bit of a pushback originally because they said, well, this is a much longer article than what we typically will Oh, yeah, publish. it's long from for sure. Yeah. And I said, but I really feel like if you don't put that in there, it's not really about how Area 51 works, because to me, it's a bigger story than just the mechanics of running a, a top secret research and development air base. And eventually they I don't know if my arguments convinced them or they just felt that it was going to be too much work to cut it down. So they published it pretty much the whole article, the way I wrote it, got published. And it's still up there at how, HowStuffWorks.com. So if you want to read a classic Jonathan Strickland article, it's How Area 51 Works. And uh, still one of the most, and like, I actually like that kind of relationship, too, between writers and editors, where you, together, your goal is to create the best article possible. Sometimes that means pushing back. Sometimes the editors are absolutely right. And, I mean, there were times where they made decisions, and I was like, oh, I'm so mad. And then, like, three weeks later, I thought, no, that was the right call. Uh, and then sometimes the writers are able to justify their choices. And that's great, too. So it's been a, a fantastic experience. It's also been great having you here. Thank you for studio. having me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I very much appreciate your time. Uh, Allison Lowermilk, the managing editor of HowStuffWorks.com. You, you, every time you go and you read something amazing, just remember that somewhere Allison was yelling at somebody to write it. <laughs> Jody Avergan here to tell you about 30 for 30 podcasts, a series of new audio documentaries from ESPN. These are sports stories that go beyond what happened on the court or on the field. In our new season, we tell the story of how the Miami Heat helped turn the hoodie into a symbol for justice. We can't help Trayvon now, but how can we help his family out? You know, me, LeBron, Chris, all of us felt a certain way, but what do y'all want to do about it? We also tell the tale of John Madden football, if I'm going to be paying a royalty on a football game, then I want the biggest name I can get. And it wasn't that hard to figure out that it was John Madden. The birth of the UFC. I was simply bringing back the glory of the ancient world. How could I go wrong? Come on. The battle to install lights at Wrigley Field. And lots more. You can find the new season and all of our episodes at 30for30podcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. I want to thank Allison again for her time, and I want to finish up this section of the show with a few more thoughts. How Stuff Works is truly an incredible place to work. I learn something new every week, and then I have the honor of sharing that with a wider audience, and I take that very seriously. It is fun, but it's also something that I think is really important to Keep in mind that this is a responsibility. Anything that lets us engage our curiosity is something I feel should be encouraged. And like Allison said, it really, working here, trains you to be a, a critical thinker, which is a skill that I think has a lot of utility outside of just writing articles. I also think it's important to point out that while the site has been through numerous major changes of ownership, and with different directives and different goals, we always tried to create the most reliable, informative, and entertaining articles, podcasts, and videos that we could manage. I know I speak for everyone when I say we take this very seriously, and it goes well beyond the editorial staff. So that's where I have my experience, obviously, in the editorial department. But we also have folks in sales and marketing and web development, and they're constantly working to improve the company in various ways. And I would not be able to do what I do without all of those people. In our next episode, we're going to revisit how stuff works, but we're going to do it with an eye on the podcast side of the business. I'll be joined by Josh Clark, 
of Stuff You Should Know fame to talk about his experiences in the podcast world as well, so you do not want to miss that episode. Thanks for listening. And for those of you who have been with me for all 900 episodes so far, a huge thanks to you guys. You've had to listen to more Jonathan Strickland than any sane person should ever endure. But seriously, you guys mean the world to me. I'm extremely thankful for your support. I'm looking forward to recording 900 more. I'm not going anywhere. So get that thought out of your heads. Now, if you have any suggestions for future episodes of Tech Stuff, maybe there's a technological subject you feel I have overlooked for long enough and gosh darn it, I need to fix that, you should let me know in a nice way, preferably. And you can do that via email. The address for the show is techstuff at howstuffworks.com or you can drop me a line on Facebook or Twitter. The handle for the show at both of those is techstuffhsw. We've got an Instagram account now and we've got an amazing person named Crystal who is She's the steward of that Instagram, and she's she's kicking technological butt, folks. So if you don't subscribe to the Instagram account for Tech Stuff, you need to go do that. Uh, also remember, I live stream these, typically, not today, but usually, and you can catch the live stream of Tech Stuff at twitch.tv slash techstuff, and you can be part of the audience and even chat in the chat room. And maybe the person who has been quietly sitting in this room this entire time, the moderator for the Twitch live stream chat, will be there to greet you or kick you out if you're a jerk. Because Cat's awesome. And guys, I will talk to you again really soon. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. Hey there, podcast listeners. I'm Will Pearson, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend, Mangesh Hatikader. Every week on Part-Time Genius, we answer big questions, like, can you game a dog show? I mean, Westminster is America's second oldest continuous sporting event. But are there shortcuts to winning? We'll meet the Michelangelo of poodle groomers, learn how to get an obscure dog breed into the show, and question things like, why do they have separate bathrooms for male and female dogs? Every episode is jam-packed with incredible stories and hilarious facts, all as we try to nail down a serious topic. So check us out already. You can download Part-Time Genius on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts.